Chapter 39 Niche Eli stepped out of the elevator into the HL Tower's garage. It was filled with an assortment of vehicles, even an army tank. He knew Robert was somewhere, working on his collection of classic cars. Robert's newest project was an old Mustang. Dad, he called out. Over here. Robert was working on the Mustang's engine. What's up? It's dinner time, Eli answered. We made spaghetti. Stella's teaching me how to cook. Robert smiled. Your mom could only cook breakfast food. And only breakfast food. Catherine's even worse. I find that hard to believe. Eli shook his head. It's bad. We survive primarily on takeout. I recall your mom being the same before she met me, Robert explained. I taught her how to make pancakes. I didn't know that. Lunch and dinner were too complicated and she gave up. In comparison, she oddly excelled at dessert. I remember. Mom used to bake cupcakes all the time. His mom had baked a big birthday cake every year for him until she couldn't. Eli hadn't eaten cake since he was 10. Robert pulled down the hood of the Mustang. He picked up a rag on the hood and wiped the oil off his hands. Do you like her? Catherine. The car. Ellie nodded. It's nice. Good. Robert reached into the pocket of his pants and pulled out a set of car keys. He threw them at Eli who caught them easily. She's yours. What? Eli stared wide-eyed at the car. But you've been working on this car for days. Yes, because it's your very late Christmas a present. Really? Robert laughed and patted him on the arm. You might not always have your suit so having a way to get around is convenient. What if I crash it? I trust you to take care of it. I don't even know how to drive. I can teach you, Robert countered, preferably before your break is over, and you can drive back to school in this. It would be nice not to have to worry about missing the train anymore when he had to go into the city. Eli rubbed the back of his neck. I don't know what to say. A thank you would be sufficient or thank you, Dad, to be specific. Thank you, Dad. You're welcome, Eli. Robert wrapped an arm around his shoulder and led him away to the elevator for dinner. Did Stella teach you how to cook steak? Not yet. We'll add to the list of things I'm going to teach you. Ellie smiled. I'm looking forward to it. A few days later, Emma went into her bedroom to escape her family for a few moments. Her dad and uncles were setting up fireworks outside the house, and her brothers were helping themselves to the chicken macaroni. Emma was catching up with Eli on the phone as he had been having a more eventful break than her. He had been getting to know his long-last father and had been gifted his own car recently. What kind of car is it? she asked. It's a 1965 Mustang, he replied. I get to spend every day worrying I will crash it. I thought you didn't even know how to drive. Dad taught me, and I now have my license. Congratulations. She took a seat on her bed, leaning against the headboard. What's your dad like? He's great. He reminds me a lot of Catherine. Have you talked to her, or are you still avoiding her calls? He paused. Ailey. She sighed. You can't avoid her forever. She's your sister. I know. It's just awkward because I'm spending all this time with our dad and she hates him. Dad asks about her all the time and I feel like I'm stuck in the middle. Families could be complicated. They could fight over the smallest of things. They could fall apart over the bigger things. And people didn't seem to know how to mend their relationships after. Maybe if you talk to her you could help bridge that divide, she suggested. It wouldn't work. When Catherine makes up her mind, she won't change it for anything or anyone. You shall call her anyway. She loves you. That's what makes it worse. I want to tell her about Dad's brewery and how he named a beer after her, Eli said. He has old photos of Mom and Catherine when she was little all over his room. He misses her. And I want to fix things but I know I can't. She might forgive him someday. It might take time. Someday could be never for Cat. Emmo thought about Uncle Felix and Susanna. They clearly still cared about each other but the pain they felt in the past made it hard to reconcile. Catherine wouldn't be so angry at her father after all these years if she didn't care about him in some way. She was still hurting. We can't do anything about Catherine for the moment, Emmo told him. Maybe you should just enjoy spending time with your dad. He's teaching you some good life skills. It does feel like a crash course in father-son bonding. Montag smilet. I'm sure if there's an exam at the end, you'll pass with flying colors. Not in cooking. Stella says my knife skills need a lot of work. Montag Laukit. She stood up and went to the window, peeling back the curtain and watched as the fireworks exploded in the sky. It was a brand new year with the promise of change and adventure.
She liked to imagine Eli was watching the same sky from New Welch, across the country from her. Happy New Year, Eli, she said. Happy New Year, Emo, he replied. I'll see you soon. I'll see you soon. Neither of them hung up, wanting to feel connected, even if it was just listening to each other breathe through the phone. Her family was celebrating in the next room with noisemakers. She realized she wished Eli was there with her, in her family home and around the people she loved most in the world. She could almost picture it. Chapter 40. Incineration. A few days later, Emma was back at the CIT campus. It was a brand new year and another semester. She couldn't wait to attend class again. Jenny was already in their room, reading over her numerous notebooks. Her roommate was always buying notebooks. Jenny seemed to go through them quickly. Emmo had been gifting her notebooks and pens which Jenny appreciated. Both of them liked to color code their notes. Eh? Hey, yen. Emmo put down her bags on her bed. How were the Alps? Jenny had told her that she was going skiing with her family for winter break. Emmo thought she would enjoy it. All that ice for Jenny's cold, cold heart. Her roommate had a disdain for warm weather that completely contrasted Emmo. Hanging in there despite climate change, Jenny replied. She paused at the sight of a pink handbag on Mo's bed. Is that a Birkin? It's a Christmas present from Blaze. Jenny came over and picked up the handbag, assessing it. Is Hart trying to buy your love now? He's not, Emmo countered. It's just a bag. A designer bag that costs at least 40 grand. She stilled. Is it that expensive? Emmo had no knowledge of designer brands. She regularly shopped at thrift stores and liked vintage clothing. Jenny would have a better idea of these expensive designers and the cost of their products. If Emmo had known how much that bag cost, she would have never even touched it out of fear of tarnishing it. He got you that after less than four months of dating? Jenny quipped dryly. What's he getting you at the one-year mark? A yacht. Blaze likes giving presents, Emmo tried to explain. She might need to have a talk with him about what kind of gifts she was comfortable with. She didn't think she could handle things that cost more than her tuition. There was a knock at the door. Emmo went to answer it and found Eli. He was carrying a large flat square item covered in silver gift wrap with a purple bow. She couldn't hug him with it in the way. Hi, she said. E. He smiled brightly and handed over the item. This is for you. Oh, thanks. She carried it inside the room and put it down on her bed. Eli followed. What is it? A very late Christmas present. I didn't get it done in time before you left for Kunth Bay Valley, and it was too big to bring on your flight anyway. He explained. Go on. Unwrap it. She smiled excitedly and tore off the gift wrap. Her heart nearly stopped as she saw it was a portable drafting board. It was about the size of a tiny table and made of pine wood. She had talked about wanting one in the past but hesitated because of the cost. This is expensive. How did you afford it? She asked, unable to tear her gaze away from the drafting board. My sister's ex-boyfriend worked as a carpenter before so I asked him to help me make it, he explained. He reached over and carefully turned over the board so she could see the back. I tried to engrave your name here since you always put your name on things anyway. Mona Lisa Ramirez was carved there in tiny script. Her eyes began to tear up. She was so overwhelmed with emotion. Eli began to look panicked as she cried. Is it that bad? He looked so worried. I can make you a better one. He was the sweetest dork she'd ever met. She throttled him into a hug, nearly making him fall over. He patted her back warily. She rested her head on his chest and wanted to squeeze his bones until he was nothing but mush. She felt like she was all mush on the inside and he deserved to feel the same way. I'm guessing you like it, he asked. I love it, she murmured into his shirt. I love it so much I hate you a little. It was the most thoughtful gift she had ever received in her life. He could only laugh relieved. She hugged him tighter. Eli could not have one day to himself. He had been so happy about Emmo loving her Christmas present, and he didn't even get the time to bask in it. He flew straight into a fight in the city. Chromium was fighting off Smokeburn's henchmen when Smokeburn blew up the train tracks, creating a large gap for the train to fall into. Incoming! Eli called out. He caught the train as it fell, widening his stance to help him support the weight. He didn't inherit Savior's super strength, but he was still strong. He gritted his teeth as the weight of the train surged forward and he tried his best to keep it from falling completely and crushing him. He couldn't pull the train out in that tiny space. He could see the terrified faces of the train conductor and passengers on board. It's going to be okay, he tried to reassure them. Try to remain calm. The train lurched backwards. Someone was pulling it back. 
He helped push it back onto trains above. There was Valiant in his blue and white suit. The people cheered loudly in gratitude. Thanks, Eli told him. Valiant smiled easily. No problem. A helicopter rose from a nearby building and began to fly away. After months of smoke burn causing problems for them, Eli wasn't about to let him get away again. Chromia must have felt the same way because he flew after the helicopter. Are you good here? Eli asked Valiant. The other hero nodded. Go get him. He flew into the air. The henchmen inside the chopper were trying to shoot at them. The bullets bounded off their suits. Chromium got close to the window where Smokeburn was seated. Give it up, Smokey, he quipped. We're too old for this. A palm-sized metal disc was thrown out of the helicopter. It landed and stuck on Chromium's chest. A gust of flame burst from the disc, burning through the metal of Chromium's suit. He went limp and began to fall. No. Eli shouted and flew down trying to reach Chromium before he landed on the ground. He wasn't fast enough. Chromium crashed to the ground, rolling over a few times before he went still. Eli landed beside him and turned him over. He pulled off the metal mask and found blood dripping out of Chromium's nose. Mr. Carlyle? Fear and dread made his voice shake. Can you hear me? There was no response. He tried to breathe. His head was spinning. Desperately, he said. Rose, check for vital signs. No vital signs detected. Rose answered. Chromium was dead. Chapter 41, Radioactive. Eli couldn't move. He cradled his head in his hands, defeated. Mr. Carlyle was dead. This made no sense. Mr. Carlyle couldn't die like this. He was supposed to retire so he could spend more time with his grandkids. He was the kind of granddad that let his granddaughter paint his nails. He had done too much good and still had a lot of left to do in the world. Ailey. A hand touched his shoulder. He looked up and it was Savior. Dad. His eyes were tearing up. I'm so sorry. I tried and I failed him. I wasn't fast enough. I know. It's not your fault. His dad's blue eyes were filled with understanding but it only made Eli feel guiltier. He took Mr. Carlos into his arms, cradling him like a child. I'll take care of him now. Could you please stay with Eli, John? John had ran over from the train and saw the entire scene. He nodded to Savior putting a comforting arm on Eli's back. Yes, Savior. Savior flew away and Eli watched as the last of Mr. Carlyle disappeared. He would be brought home to his family, his body broken and bloody. They deserved better than this. He deserved better than this. We should go, Eli, John said. Where? We could go the tower. Or do you have someone you want to see? He could have gone to Catherine. She would comfort him and tell him none of this was his fault, but he didn't want to see her. She worked with the people that caused all of this. Her hands were as bloody as theirs. Ailey. John sounded concerned. I don't want to go home. He didn't really have one anymore. He had been the boy without a father for so long until Mr. Carlyle showed up and offered him the promise of becoming a hero. Mr. Carlyle mentored and believed in him, and it only went to nothing. Eli was a disappointment and it cost his mentor's life. I need to go, he continued. I have to find someone. Who? Suns Park. He shot into the air like a cannon. The wind flew past him quickly as he headed to the SETI campus. The helicopter was long gone but Blaze Hart always went back to campus, and Eli would be waiting. Mondays were the worst. Tadashi called Emo after her last class of the day. He sounded worried. She walked through the hallway, waving tiredly at a few of her classmates. Where are you right now? he asked. On the way back to my dorm, she answered. What's wrong? Eli's acting erratic. He won't tell me why. Did something happen? I don't know. Tadashi sighed. Could you come here? You're really good at calming him down. Sure. She walked faster to get to the Parker building. She didn't bother dropping her stuff in her room and went straight to Eli and Tadashi's. She knocked and Tadashi opened the door. He looked relieved to see her and let her in. He's been pacing for over an hour, Tadashi explained. He won't keep still and he doesn't want to talk. Eli was pacing back and forth on the carpet, occasionally checking his smartwatch. Is he off his medication? She asked. I don't think so. Tadashi's eyebrows furrowed. He could be. Could you leave us alone for a few minutes? Tadashi nodded. I'm going to get a snack. The other boy left, closing the door quietly behind him. Emo put down her things on the floor and approached Eli slowly. She said, Eli. He continued pacing and didn't look at her. Eli, she called out. He looked over at her, his eyes looked wild. 
His brown eyes were glassy and red-rimmed. Something bad must have happened. He reminded her of a wounded animal. What happened? She asked, moving closer to him. You can tell me. He shook off her touch. I can't. Why not? He shook his head. She stepped in front of him blocking his path. He tried to move around her and she sidestepped him again. She stared up at him defiantly. Wordlessly, his arms grabbed her at the waist and picked her up with surprising strength and put her aside. He went back to pacing. Annoyed, she grabbed his arm and pulled him back. Hey, she told him. Look at me. She took his face in her hands and forced him to stay still so his brown eyes focused on her. She demanded. What is going on? Why don't you ask your boyfriend? What? He tried to pull away but she held on. What does that mean, Eli? He scoffed. Maybe don't date horrible people, huh? I thought you were smarter than that. Horrible people? She repeated. Should I be dating somebody else then? He didn't answer. You started it, she continued. Finish what you were saying. Don't be a coward now. His brown eyes bore into her. You had to know how I felt about you. Everyone could see it. And yet you still had to date him. Of all people, it had to be him. You never said a word. I tried. You didn't. She shook her head. You didn't tell me how you felt. How was I supposed to be sure, and not just think I was making it up in my head? She saw the way he smiled at her. He remembered everything she told him and knew what presence would make her the happiest. He was so nice and it was hard to tell when good guys liked you. She didn't know if she was special or if he was just being nice. She needed verbal confirmation that he did like her more than a friend. Emotions like that needed to be spoken into life and not kept like a secret. Otherwise they were unborn ugly things. Things that would become terrible and hurtful once they grew. I couldn't tell you, he said. There are things in my life that are dangerous. I could put you at risk if you knew. He was a big idiot. He had all these vague warnings of things that had nothing to do with the situation when the real problem was that he was a coward. I know you're elect. Chapter 42, Atomic. Eli stopped. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. There was no way Amo could know about him. He had moments of being careless but she would have said something before now. What? My uncle is a superhero. I grew up around this stuff. You really thought I wouldn't be able to put it together. She said. Your disappearances right as Electric appeared? Not to mention that time I went to your dorm and found that metal box with your suit just lying on your bed. He really needed to start locking doors more. You didn't say anything. I was waiting for you to tell me. She explained frustrated. I wanted you to trust me. No one was supposed to know. Cut the bullshit. Tadashi knows. She gave him a look. A hiking club in New Welch? Really? He grimaced. Tadashi came up with that excuse. It's not my fault. Nothing is your fault. Like not telling me your feelings is somehow my fault or blazes, she fumed. You're trying to blame it on your secret life, but you didn't tell me about your feelings before you became electric either. He swallowed, realizing the truth in her words. He had been ruled by fear and anxiety. He had feared rejection so he put it off until it was too late. He was a coward that hid behind a metal mask to feel strong. You don't get to be angry at me for dating somebody else, Emo declared. And if you can't be happy for me, then we can't be friends. Montak. She turned away, grabbing her things and leaving without looking back. She slammed the door behind her. He groaned and wanted to tear his hair out. All he could seem to do was mess everything up. Blaze Hart has arrived on campus, Rose chirped. I advise against a public confrontation. Eli wasn't listening. He didn't care if everyone on campus watched. He ran out of the Parker building, dodging people going to dinner. Blaze lived at the Allardyce building across campus. He ran faster as he saw the building within view. Then he saw Blaze outside that building, talking to his friends and smiling like he hadn't murdered anyone today. George Carlyle was dead and being mourned by his family, and Blaze was laughing. Eli had never hated anyone in his life, but this rage in his blood felt close to it. Blaze noticed him. Eli could feel his power sparking in his hands, waiting to be unleashed. Blaze said something hurriedly to his friends before turning tail and running, like the spineless worthless piece of SHD he was. Hey, Eli yelled. Come back here. Blaze kept running. Eli chased him, his blood boiling. Street lamps exploded behind Blaze as he passed by them, bathing the path in darkness. Eli did not stop, throwing an electric blast and missed. The blast hit a nearby building, the lights flickering inside before dying out. Blaze turned and led them to the part of campus under construction. 
It was the same place Blaze had blackmailed him into keeping quiet about his identity. He had been so stupid, letting himself be bullied into doing whatever Blaze wanted. If he had just stood up to him, told the HL who he was, maybe Mr. Carlyle wouldn't be dead. Blaze finally stopped. He raised his hand surrender. I don't want to fight. That's new. Eli threw a blast of energy at him. You liked fighting so much before. I know you're angry, and you have every right to be. I did not know that was going to happen. OFCK oh, you. Eli threw blasts of energy one after another at Blaze. It burned through his clothes, his blonde hair standing on end from the static. It didn't hurt him at first but eventually he sunk to his knees, the excessive energy overwhelming him. He would explode like an overloaded battery. Stop, Blaze begged, panting. You're going to kill me. I know. Eli concentrated and the largest blast he'd ever felt was in his hands, ferocious and alive like a flash of lightning. You deserve this and you know it. I didn't know about the doctor's new invention, Blaze explained desperately. I didn't know my dad was going to do that. Your dad? Smoke burns my dad. I only followed what he told me to do. And you think that absolves you from the things you've done? I know it doesn't. Blaze's green eyes were pleading. I'm just trying to explain. I never wanted chromium to die. I never wanted anyone to die. What about the people on the train? Or all the buildings you set on fire? I always knew you or any of the heroes would save them. I don't believe you. Eli threw the large blast of energy. It surrounded Blaze like a beacon of purple light. Blaze screamed as his body absorbed it. His skin was glowing a bright red. The fire in his body bright like the magma erupting out of a volcano. Blaze collapsed to his hands and knees, breathing heavily through the pain. Eli approached him, his anger urging him on. Blaze looked up at him pitifully. How many times had Blaze made him feel helpless? Please, Blaze pleaded. Fight back, Eli snarled. No. Fight back. Eli threw a punch at him, knocking him over to his side. There was a sickening crunch as his fist collided with Blaze's nose. Blood poured and bathed Blaze's mouth red. Eli remembered Mr. Carlyle's face covered in blood. Fight back. Eli kicked him in the stomach. What's stopping you? Blaze coughed and he shook his head. I'm not going to fight you. And why the FCK not? Blaze wiped at his bloody nose and mouth and declared. You can hit me as much as you. You can even kill me but it's not going to bring back chromium. Don't say his name. The blast of energy was stronger this time. Eli remembered this was how it felt when he caused that blackout in the city when his powers came. Energy so powerful he couldn't contain it. Blaze didn't look afraid. He looked resigned to his fate. Eli glared at him. Fight back. No. Chapter 43 Acidic Eli was frustrated at Blaze, at himself, at the truth that he couldn't bring back Mr. Carlyle. He growled and threw the blast of energy at the nearby building under construction. It burst through a panel of wood, leaving a large hole. Fire sparked, eager to consume. Blaze raised a hand and the fire went out like a whimper. Eli glared at the dark sky. The rage in his blood made it hard to think. It felt like it was eating through him. He wanted a place to exorcise all of his hatred, but it had nowhere to go. Blaze would not fight him and Eli could find no satisfaction on repeatedly kicking a man when he was down. He was so done with feeling helpless. Eli took a seat on the grass. He closed his eyes, exhausted and wished this was all a bad dream. I'm sorry, Blaze said. I know it means nothing to you but I really am sorry. No you're not. The words were meaningless. Eli had lost his mom at a young age and learned the hard way that no amount of regret could bring back the dead. He had been powerless each time he lost someone, no matter what powers he had or how strong he became. Blaze sat up. A quiet somber overcame them. Anger cooling to an aching emptiness, Eli refused to cry. He missed his mom. I was never asked if I wanted this life, Blaze confessed softly. My dad decided for me. I followed whatever he said. I never questioned anything he told me. Eli kept quiet. Maybe I did question some of the things he had me do, but I ignored any doubt I felt. I wanted him to be proud of me, Blaze continued. That overrode anything else. I was afraid he would stop loving me, and that felt like the worst thing in the world. Why are you telling me this? I wanted you to know that we're not that different. We were just stupid kids that got pulled into this life, not knowing what we were getting into. We are not alike, Eli retorted. I wanted to be a hero. I wanted to help people. He had tried to be good. He had wanted to be like the heroes of his childhood. All Blaze had done was do terrible thing and now he wanted sympathy. They would never be alike. Why do we really hate each other? 
Outside of MO, we were parroting Chromium and Smokeburn's hatred for each other, Blaze continued. They had this rivalry that stared before we were even born. We were going to become them and fight each other until one of us died. What the hell are you trying to get at? Blaze slowly got to his feet. I am done fighting with you, Eli. You can hate me as much as you want, but I won't return it. I am not going to keep this enmity alive. It won't fix things, Eli pointed out bitterly. Chromium's death is still on you. Blaze's green eyes looked tired. I know. The blonde walked away, limping slightly. Eli watched him as he disappeared out of view into the darkness. Eli had never felt more alone in his life. Like a child, he wished he could talk to his mom. She would have found a way to make things better somehow. After the confrontation with Eli, Emo had gone to Blaze's dorm to talk to him. She wanted to forget about everything and Blaze was good at making her forget. He would whisk them off on some wonderful adventure, and she could pretend everything was perfect. She wouldn't have to focus on Eli's feelings for her, and how she felt about him. Blaze's roommate let her in before he left for dinner. Emo had been in Blaze's room a few times. It was still messy in the way young guy's room was meant to be, and she couldn't help but tidy it up a bit. She could at least make the bed. The sheets need changing. She pulled them off the mattress and went to Blaze's closet to find a fresh pair of sheets. It was just as messy inside the closet, his clothes and a bundle inside haphazardly shoved in. She looked through the pile, trying to find anything that could be a bed sheet. She found a spot of red through the pile and reached in to see what it was. Her stomach dropped when she saw it was a familiar red mask. Could be a copy. She knew there were people that admired supervillains for some dark reason or another. Her gut feeling told her it wasn't that. She had noticed disappearances as she did with Eli. She didn't want to believe they were for a similar reason. What girl wanted to think her boyfriend was a supervillain, capable of committing terrible things? The door opened and Blaze came in. He was limping and there was blood on his face. His clothes had holes and tears as if he tried to climb a spiked fence. She could smell the smoke off him. Her stomach plummeted somewhere by her feet. He smiled at first seeing her, almost relieved, until he saw what she was holding. He stared at her pleadingly. It's not what you think. What is it then, Blaze? She raised the mask in her hand. Is this a Halloween costume? Let me explain. He went to her and she stepped back until her back hit the wall. She pushed him away with an arm and exclaimed, don't touch me. Just let me explain. Explain what? She looked at him like she hadn't seen him before because that's what he was this stranger who had been doing nothing but lie and hurting people. She remembered all those fires. She let him kiss her and touch her. She felt tainted. I'm still the same guy I was before, he told her urgently. I have another life outside of you but it doesn't change anything. I'm still Blaze and I feel the exact same way as I did before. No, she dropped the mask and pushed him away when he tried to pull her into his arms. I don't want this. He looked devastated. You don't want me? Not this. Not any of it. She ran as fast as she could. Bile was clawing up her throat. She could still remember clearly finding out about Uncle Felix being the Silver Jaguar, and how proud she had been. She vowed to never settle for anything less than a hero. She ended up with a villain instead. It all sounded like a cruel joke. Chapter 44 Erosion Eli watched as the coffin was lowered into the ground. No one really got used to grief. The loss each time was new and terrible in a hundred different ways. Eli felt numb at Mr. Carlyle's funeral. Having barely known the man, Eli felt as if was intruding on people who truly had the right to mourn him. Mrs. Carlyle looked brittle and gray. He couldn't imagine being married to someone for over thirty years, standing by them as they led another life as a superhero, and then being left behind without a goodbye. There were the grandkids that all looked small and lost. Mr. Carlyle had been excited to retire and be able to have the time to watch them grow up, and now he never would. Eli's feet led him away, down the gravestones to the familiar path he took a few times a year. He found his mother's grave easily enough. Catherine must have visited not too long ago as there were fresh flowers. He could barely remember her funeral. All he could recall was the suit that had been too big on him, and Catherine mechanically going through the motions. She shut down and kept all her bad emotions deep inside of her. He thought she couldn't stand to appear weak. He learned it could be because she felt so much pain that it was easier to push it away until it couldn't destroy you. He knelt down and wiped the snow off her gravestone. E, mum. I'm sorry I haven't been around lately. I don't think she holds it against you. Robert knelt down beside him and placed a bouquet of yellow daisies on the grave. They had been her favorite flowers. I try to visit her once a month to keep her updated on things. You do. 
Robert hadn't been at the funeral. Eli had never seen him around the graveyard every time he and Catherine came to visit. Maybe they always missed him or Robert came when they wouldn't be there. His dad nodded. I hadn't been around in her last year so I guess I'm trying to make up for it somehow. As if it makes a difference. I should have been there for the car crash. Where were you? I was out of the country, stopping a ship from sinking. By the time anyone got to the crash, she was gone. It had been a brutal crash. They had kept the casket closed. I should have been there, Robert insisted. I did nothing but fail her. I did nothing but fail you and your sister. Eli swallowed as he took this all in. The truth is I was selfish. I like being savior being special. I wanted it more than anything so I walked away, Robert continued. And then when Rebecca was gone, I didn't try hard enough to be in your life. I could have kept trying. I knew Catherine was hurting and I ran away again because I couldn't face that I was a disappointment. Eli said nothing. Robert sighed and stood up. He added, I'm sorry for everything you've gone through, Eli. You're all grown up and I wasn't there to see it. I wish I could have been better for you. Be better now. Don't walk away again. Eli stated, You stay and keep trying even when it gets hard. You can't change the past so make the future better. Catherine wants nothing to do with me. She loves you. She misses you so much she won't admit it, Eli countered. We don't need savior. We never did. We have only ever needed you. Robert stared at him for a long moment. Fear and longing warred inside him before finally surrendered. It had never been a battle worth fighting. He nodded. Okay, I'm here. Blaze walked through the Parker building. There was a group of students huddled over a TV and watching the news. Blaze tried to avoid the news. Everywhere he turned, people were talking about Chromium's death. It coincided with George Carlyle's death. City alumni who frequently provided grants and scholarships to the school. The whole city was in mourning and that included Sai. He tried to push away that familiar guilt creeping into his lungs. He may not have been the one to kill Chromium but he was his father's son and that blood trickled down to his hands. He had no one he could talk to about this. Mo finally found out about his other life. And she wanted nothing to do with him. He could imagine her seeing the news and hating him for it. He was not the type to give up easily, even at impossible odds. He knocked on the door loudly. It opened and he saw Mo's roommate, Jenny Moon, who glared at him. He asked, Is Mo here? No, and I'm not telling you where she is. He scowled and pushed past her into the room. Mo really wasn't there. Jenny crossed her arms over her chest. Her blue eyes bore icily into him. He could imagine she was made from ice, not an ounce of warmth inside of her. Where is she? He demanded. Why would I tell you? She's avoiding you for a reason. His jaw clenched as he bit back a curse. This girl made his temper flare faster than anyone. She had decided to hate him from the very first moment they met even as he tried to be nice to her. It was futile trying to befriend somebody so cold. He took a seat on Jenny's bed, wanting to annoy her as much as she did him. He grabbed the white teddy and hugged it to his chest. I'll just wait there till she gets back then. She has to sleep eventually. The anger breaking her icy facade was wonderful. It made her blue eyes brighten with life. Her cheeks flushed an attractive pink. In another world where he didn't know how mean she was, he might have asked her out. She was astonishingly pretty. Get out, she hissed like an angry cat. He smiled mockingly. He looked down at the teddy bear in his hands and said, What do you think, Mr. Bear? Should I leave? You're saying I can stay here? Thanks. Jenny grabbed the bear from him hugging it protectively to her. Leave or I will call campus security. And tell them what? He got to his feet and hovered over her, his green eyes glaring into hers. Why do you hate me so much, Jenny? What did I ever do to you? Not to me. His eyebrows furrowed. What does that mean? You hated me before Emo started avoiding me. I don't like you for the things you've done, she answered. And for all the things you're going to do, you're not a good person. Panic flared in him. Did Emo tell you anything? She didn't need to. I know you. The way she said it made her pause. As if they had known each other for years, and she had seen all of his secrets. There was knowledge in her blue eyes that worried him. Like looking into the deep abyss and finding a truth you never wanted to learn about yourself. What do you know? He asked. Enough to know you're not worth keeping. That felt like a punch to the gut. She didn't seem to care how it made him feel, and she went to the door and opened it. Now would you please? Chapter 45 Adhesion Eli stopped outside Catherine's apartment. This had been his home for almost a decade. He had hated it at first, missing the bigger house in Midtown. 
the apartment had felt claustrophobic in comparison, especially in the first few months where Catherine was trying her best to keep everything together. He unlocked the door with his key and let himself in. He could smell coffee and pastries. Catherine would be coming back from brunch at the cafe. It had been her and her best friend's tradition since graduating from NWU. Catherine had her big mug of coffee in hand and she paused when she saw him. Ailey. Hi, he said lamely. I'm not interrupting anything, am I? It's fine. I wasn't doing anything. She was pleased to see him. He could see it on her face. Have you eaten? I have those croissants from the bakery nearby. No, thank you. I'm not hungry. He was starving but hadn't been able to get himself to eat. The smell of baked goods and coffee was making him dizzy. His stomach growled loudly, and he blushed in embarrassment. Catherine smiled slightly. Are you sure? She asked. I have a whole box of croissants. I even got the chocolate ones you like. He smiled, too tired not to give in. He had missed her dearly. They went to the living room and sat on the couch as they ate the croissants. The last thing he'd eaten was a protein bar that morning which he'd stolen from Tadashi. I heard about what happened with chromium, Catherine said, never one for dancing around an issue. How are you handling it? I almost killed Sun's Park. Her brown eyes widened. He continued, I didn't go through with it. I was angry and he was there. Eli could still remember the way Blaze kept refusing to fight him, apologizing for a death his father had committed, and wanting Eli to understand they weren't so different. Eli had drawn blood and Blaze did not retaliate. I'm not one to judge about anger and misplaced venting, Catherine quipped lightly. Are you okay? The fact was that Eli didn't have it in him to hate anyone. It exhausted him and settled heavily into his bones. I still can't believe chromium is gone. I keep thinking it was my fault, Eli replied. If I got to him sooner or if I shot down that helicopter, he would still be there. His death isn't on you. You can't do anything about what happened. What am I supposed to do now? Just move on. Smokeburn's still walking free out there. His time will come, Catherine reassured him. If it makes you feel better, Marie has been looking for an excuse to kick him out of the VA, and Smokeburn has broken the VA policies one too many times. Will the VA go after him? No, but we're not assisting him in the future. If the HL catches him, he's on his own. Catherine met his gaze. Are you planning your revenge scheme? There was some comfort in knowing even the VA found Smokeburn repugnant. He didn't know who would finally bring down Smokeburn but he knew it wouldn't be him. He shook his head. Smokeburn needs to pay for his crimes, but I'm not planning on chasing him to the ends of the earth. What do you want to do then? He had been thinking these past few days after Mr. Carlyle's death about what he wanted to do with his life, about his place in the HL, and reached a conclusion. You were right. I am too young to be a hero, he admitted. I didn't really know what I was getting into, and I don't think I want to be electric for a while. You're quitting. He nodded. I'd like to only be Eli for now. I want to figure myself out first before I have to deal the insanity of another life. You don't need to quit just because I don't approve of you being a hero, she told him. As much as it pains me, you were born to be one. You'd be the ones they put on cereal boxes and little kids would aspire to be like someday. I'm not walking away for good. He knew it with a certainty in his gut. There would come the day he put on his suit and he would return to being electric. He would be doing this until he died. Like his father and his grandfather, he had been born for a purpose greater than himself, and you couldn't run from destiny forever. I want to only worry about midterms for a while, he continued, and just be a normal college kid. I hate to break it to you but you were never normal. He gave her a look. You know what I mean. She smiled and he smiled back. Felt good to be home. It was a feeling he had taken for granted too many times. He added, I'm sorry for not answering your calls. She shrugged and took a sip of her coffee. You were due your teenage rebellion. You've been a good kid for too long. I was with dad, he admitted. He's been great so far. You should talk to him. She stiffened. Her expression blank. She was hiding her emotions beyond that unbreakable wall. You don't have to do it now but someday when you're hurting less you should he continued. He misses you and I know you miss him. Life is too short to hate the people that you love, Cat. I can't, she replied bluntly. I won't. Not after everything he did. I have dinner with him every Friday. You can join us when you're ready. That will never happen. She sighed, softening. But thank you for the invite. He couldn't press her more. She was defensive and she would not budge. 
This would take time but he could wait. All the important things in life were worth the- Chapter 46 Binomial Mo's first instinct after finding out about Blaze being a villain was to call her uncle. She ran to her dorm and locked it behind her. Jenny was probably still at the dining hall. She reached for her phone in her pocket and waited impatiently as the line rang. Uncle Felix didn't answer. He could have been on patrol or in the middle of fight. She tried calling him a few more times but the line kept going to voicemail. She left a message for him to call her back and tried to think of what to do next. She went online and did a search about Suns Park. A news report had been released that Smokeburn had killed Chromium. There was a video of Chromium crashing to the ground as Electric tried to reach him. There were photos of Electric kneeling over Chromium and Savior flying away with the body. Eli's behavior from earlier began to make sense. He must have been reeling from the shock. Her phone rang and she answered it quickly. Uncle Felix. E. Nay. Eraplia. Charili. You sounded distressed. What's going on? I need to tell you something. I just found out about Suns Park. Everybody's seen the news about Chromium. All of the HL is shaken up. We didn't think he would go that way. Not about that, she clarified. I know Sunspark's real identity. There was a heavy pause. Emma waited, wondering why her uncle wasn't excitedly asking for Sunspark's real name. His jurisdiction wasn't in the East Coast but all he had to do was make a phone call. Blaze would be carted off to maximum prison before the day was out. Uncle Felix? Does he know you? He asked. Does he know your name and where you live? Yes, but what does that? Don't tell me who he is. Her eyebrows furrowed in confusion. Why not? Because you'll be painting a target on your back if you do. Villains have no scruples about revenge. They enjoy it, he explained. They will find you, your family, all your friends, and make you pay. We can't just let a villain walk free because we're afraid of retribution. Montag Agut. These people deserve to be in jail for all the crimes they commit. Do you know the story of the commander's wife? Commander Valor. His arch-nemesis, Red Vale, found out his true identity. He kidnapped the commander's wife and murdered her, he continued. Driven mad with grief, Commander Valor and Red Vale had their final face-off which resulted in both of their deaths. She had heard some version of the sad story since she was a child. It had been the horror story people whispered about. Commander Valor had almost been godlike, untouchable, until he lost somebody he loved. He became human, a grieving man who died as he achieved his vengeance. The story had been the bogeyman for superheroes. It represented the very real risk of what happened once the mask was ripped off them. Their loved ones were always at risk. Once the mask came off there was no putting it back on. We can't just let go. Not after Chromium's death, Emo reasoned. Think about what it will be like on his end. Once you out him, everyone he loves is in danger. That made Emo pause. Blaze had spoken about his family briefly. He had a complicated relationship with his father and his mother adored him. He had been good friends with the entire rowing team. All of those people could become targets. I don't know how I'll be able to see him around and pretend I don't know what he's done, Emmo said. It makes me sick thinking about how easily he fooled everyone. Secrets and lies are unfortunately a part of the job for both sides. He sighed. It's what causes most of the tension for our personal lives. He was talking about Susanna again. Her uncle had only ever loved one woman and refused to love another. Emo envied that kind of love. She wished she could have something like it for herself. Are you still waiting for Susanna? I got nothing else to do outside of fighting crime and sharpening the claws of my suit. She smiled at his glibness. Have you thought about quitting being Silver Jaguar and hanging up the claws? If I do that, who will keep the West Coast safe? All the other heroes over there, she replied. You could find a younger hero to mentor and retire. Isn't that what you told me Chromium had been doing? He sighed deeply. I couldn't. This is a part of me. It's who I am. You have given over 20 years of your life to being a hero, and you've done an admiral job, she told him. But after today and we saw what happened with Chromium, what if you decide to quit and it's too late? You said you love Susanna so why not pick her this time? I always thought I'd go out in some dramatic, glorious way, like an explosion or a brutal fight with a robot dinosaur. She smiled, able to picture it. Or you could grow old with the woman you love. That works too, he admitted. It sounds amazing actually. So you're doing it? I'm going to think it over this weekend. If I do decide to give up the cowl, I'm going to have to go to the HL Tower in San May and look for my replacement, he answered. I'll have to train them until I'm confident in their abilities. It could take months. 
She tried to imagine a world without Silver Jaguar. It sounded scary, but she had faith they would be okay. Heroes deserved retirement like everyone else. And in the end, Uncle Felix deserved to be happy and content with the love of his life. You can spend the time wooing Auntie Sue into taking you back, she remarked. Do what you two did for fun back when you were young. Ouch. He laughed. Don't I feel ancient? You could ask me for romantic advice. My door's always open. Thanks, Nay, but I think I'm going to be fine, he declared. Your dad was the one with zero game. If I hadn't been his wingman when he met your mom, you wouldn't be here. Dad told me a different story. Of course he did. I am and have always been the better twin, he added. The best thing he ever made was you but don't tell your brothers that. I wouldn't want to break their spirits. She laughed. Love you, Uncle Felix. I love you too, Nay. Chapter 47 Transition There were moments Eli missed being able to fly in his suit. The cost of parking in New Welch was one of them. He had to park further away from the brewery to avoid paying an additional $10. It made him consider just taking the train to the city instead. His dad's brewery was located in an old red brick building that was formerly a fire station. He made his way inside and passed the taproom into the back where the fermentation tanks were. His dad was talking to a few people. Eli smiled when his dad noticed him and waved him over. Glad you could make it, Eli, Robert said. We just tasted this new variant of Catherine Sunshine. Do you want to try it? I'm not really 21 yet. I won't tell if you won't. His dad offered him the half-empty pint and Eli accepted it. This one's a little sweeter than the original. Eli took a sip and it did taste almost like a fruity cocktail. I thought Catherine Sunshine was known for being sweet already. Robert shrugged. We're just trying something new. And the color is a little more golden. It's pretty. His dad nodded, smiling. Let's get dinner. I'm in the mood for steak. Eli left the pint and they left the brewery for the restaurant nearby. It was a small but busy place. The owners knew Robert and they were able to get a table quickly. Robert ordered a bottle of wine to go with their meal. How's school? His dad asked. It's good. I'm learning a lot. It had been a few weeks since he quit being electric. He still missed Mr. Carlyle and the world was mourning chromium but he was taking things one day at a time. Eli was admittedly feeling a little restless. After months of having to fly off to put out literal fires on top of dealing with midterms, his days now were relaxed and easy in comparison. He was not used to having this much free time. It made him consider joining a club, one that wasn't imaginary. How's the HL? Eli saw it at his stake with a knife. Any updates on capturing smoke burn? Don't worry about him. His day is coming. Things are different without George but we'll manage. You looking for my replacement yet? He joked. He didn't really think Electric disappearing was going to leave much of an impact. There were plenty of heroes in the HL. He had been a hero for only four months. Robert gave him a look. If you want to come back, you just have to say so. We'll be happy to have you as part of the team again. I know. Eli cleared his throat. I was just kidding. You know I want to focus on college and it was a nightmare trying to balance it with crime fighting. I wasn't even that good at being a hero to begin with. His plate broke. He sawed past the stake and the porcelain broke under his strength. Eli flushedin embarrassment. He hadn't broken anything like that since he was 12. Robert waved a waiter over who carried the broken plate away. It's really okay, Eli. You should focus on school and enjoy your youth. I wish I had waited before joining the HL. I was only 21 when I did, not much older than you are now. The world needed you, and you needed the income to support mom and Catherine. I didn't say I regret having your sister. Robert hesitated before asking, How is she? I saw her last week. She's doing well. Catherine still refused to join them for Friday dinner but Eli had faith that she would change her mind someday. Catherine pretended to be tough but she was just a big softy deep inside. She ever tried any of my beers? She's more of a wine girl. Like your mom. Robert laughed. Rebecca could drink bottles of wine all by herself. Are you saying mom was an alcoholic? That would be an exaggeration. Robert took a sip of his wine. But not by much. Dad. Tadashi looked down from the top of the King State Building. It was the highest tower in New Welch. Falling from it would surely kill anyone that didn't have superpowers. And that was why Tadashi was jumping off it. He had spent his winter break trying numerous activities that spiked his adrenaline. He had read somewhere that adrenaline could trigger latent superpowers. There was nothing that really backed up the theory but he refused to just wait for death. He couldn't live waking up every day terrified that it would be his last. 
he was doing something about it. His hands were shaking as he stepped on the edge. It would just take one step. Everything would be fine. It had to be. What was the alternative? He was going to die either way. This would be the faster route. Maybe he should have had that extra taco earlier. Give himself a little treat before his possible end but he'd been too nervous to eat much. His heart was beating like a fast drum. He took his phone out of his pocket and called Eli. It went to voicemail. Hey Eli, he said. I kind of have to tell you that I'm about to jump off a really high building. It's no big deal. I wanted you to know it wasn't your fault especially after what you've gone through these past few months. He looked up at the night sky. The light pollution from the city made it hard to see the stars. He tried to remember what the stars looked like back home in San Luis Los. He wanted the last thing he might see to be something nice. In case this goes horribly wrong, I have a box underneath my bed with letters I'll need you to give to people. I'm sorry for dumping that on you. Tadashi laughed nervously. If I die, I need you to know that you're my best friend and I love you. Thanks for everything. Bue, Eli. He threw his phone behind him. It was now or never. He closed his eyes and took the leap. Chapter 48, Magnetic. Tadashi was falling. There was the disconcerting feel of having nothing beneath him and gravity pulling him down before a force grabbed him midair. He opened his eyes and saw a familiar metal suit. He was in Electric's arms. Glowing purple eyes glared into him. I'm going to f***ing kill you. Hey, Eli, he replied, gleebly. It's nice to see you back in your suit. Tadashi wrapped an arm around Eli's neck for better support. What were you thinking? Didn't you get my voicemail? I did. Eli flew them onto the rooftop of an apartment building. He dropped Tadashi like a sack of potatoes. You almost gave me a heart attack. I thought you were dead. Tadashi sat up gingerly. As you can see, I am perfectly fine. Eli's suit retreated back into his watch. He was scowling. That is up for debate. There is something seriously wrong with you. That's why I had to jump. I needed to trigger my powers. You don't have any powers, Eli retorted. It's been over a month since the lightning strike. Your powers should have appeared by now. Tadashi stood up. He cleared his throat. No one knows when they'll appear. The serum is unpredictable. Hyperbeam did not give you the serum. Eli exclaimed. Why can't you accept that you're just not special? Tadashi stilled. The bloom of hurt made him swallow. It would have hurt less if Eli had punched him. Tadashi knew Eli was upset because he made his friend worry but this was really harsh. It's not only about that. I don't want to die, Eli. He tried to explain. I wake up every single day wondering if I'm going to melt into a puddle of goo or explode in the middle of class. I don't know what's going to happen to me, and I'm scared. He sniffed and added. I just wanted to get it over with. If I died today it would have been on my terms. I'm sorry I worried you. Eli Sayed, deflating. He looked guilty. I'm sorry I said you weren't special. It's not true. You are. Tadashi scoffed. This is coming from the guy who can throw around electrical blasts and leap high into the air? You graduated valedictorian. You're top of our class and a dean's lister, Eli replied. You're in three different clubs and make friends everywhere you go. When you graduate, you're going to do amazing things. I do have plans to be the next George Carlyle. Tadashi smiled, feeling better. Thanks, Eli. Who needs superpowers when you're already this great? Eli smiled back. Come on. Let's go home. Are you carrying me home? Tadashi couldn't hide his excitement at being able to fly. I drove here. We'll take my car. Tadashi frowned, disappointed. Can I at least drive your car? No. Can I borrow the suit? Tadashi tried again. Give me five minutes. That's all I need. No. You're not using it anyway. They went down the stairs of the apartment building. Tadashi insisted. I'd say if you're going to prematurely retire, you might as well let somebody else use the suit and do the crime fighting. And now you're trying to replace me? I would make a better electric and you know it. Eli rolled his eyes. Keep telling yourself that. After weeks of torment, Tadashi finally felt he might be all right. Who needed superpowers anyway? Not Tadashi Ito. He was amazing with or without them. Emo and Jenny shared a love for coffee. They had frequented the cafe on campus since their first semester at Saiti. Jenny drank her coffee black. Whether she liked it that bitter or used it as an intimidation tactic, Mo didn't know but it worked. Jenny looked at her over her steaming cup of black poison. When are you breaking up with heart? We're broken up, Emo answered. We didn't make it official but it's over for all intents and purposes. Emo had told Jenny about what happened while keeping things vague. 
She was glad Jenny was never one to pry and accepted the story she gave her. You can't keep avoiding him forever, her roommate reminded her. He keeps showing up at the dorm and pestering me about you. He got a hold of my number and is trying to annoy me into helping him. Montag grimaced. Block him. I did. Jenny's blue eyes narrowed. He changed his number the next day. Why am I the one being tormented by your boyfriend? He's not my boyfriend, Emmo countered sighing. And can we stop talking about him? Fine. Jenny showed her phone to Emmo. It looks like Electric's back. There was a video of Electric flying through Midtown. There were reports that he saved somebody that fell from the King State building. The identity of the jumper was not revealed. People were excited at the prospect of the superhero's return. Isn't he your favorite hero? Jenny asked. Emmo took a sip of her caramel coffee. Silver Jaguar is my favorite. I heard Silver Jaguar's retiring. Uncle Felix had finally decided to bite the bullet and he was giving up his claws. He was currently training his replacement and had high hopes for him. Susanna had agreed to start over with Uncle Felix and they were going on dates. Emmo had been tracking their posts on Instagram, and they were adorable. Uncle Felix didn't seem to have any regrets about his decision. Emmo couldn't be happier for him. He's been saving the world for over two decades. He deserves a rest, Emmo declared. Let the new generation take over. The new generation dipped for a few weeks, so I don't know about that, Jenny countered. Where do you think Electric was off to? The city needed him more after what happened to Chromium. Emmo hadn't talked to Eli in a while. She felt awkward after their fight, and she was afraid she would accidentally tell him about Blaze's alter ego. They had faced off a few times since last semester, and she didn't want to cause them to fight on campus. We don't know what he was dealing with. It can't be easy being a superhero. Emmo tried to defend him. Jenny's blue eyes assessed her. It sounds like you have some knowledge about heroes. I'm just guessing. I can feel empathy for people. Jenny scoffed. It's a waste of time, really. Empathy or people? Both. Emmo laughed, used to her roommate's pessimism. This has been fun, Jen. I have to go. I'm going into the city with some of my classmates. Jenny frowned. Do you have to? There's nothing worse than taking the train during the weekend. All those strangers cramped with you inside a train car. I've done it before and I survived. Emmo got to her feet and took her coat off the back of her chair to put it on. We have to get school supplies, and I want to stare at the King State Building for inspiration. It's just a building. It's not. It's a masterpiece, Emmo countered. Now, if you'll excuse me. Wait. Jenny looked slightly alarmed. Shouldn't you take someone with you? Maybe Eli. Why would Eli want to stare at a building with me? You're both huge dorks. He would probably do it because you asked him. That was right. Eli had feelings for her. Whether he still did, she didn't know. And she was terrified to have to ask him. She checked her watch. I really need to go. Be Yen. Montak. Jenny called out. You don't know what's going to. She didn't hear the rest of what her roommate said because she was already running out of the cafe. Chapter 49. Ultraviolet. Eli was woken up from a pleasant dream by a loud banging noise. He found out it was someone knocking aggressively on the door of his dorm room. Blearily, he got up and found Jenny Moon on the other side of the door. Her blue eyes glared into him before she pushed her way inside the room. Morning, Jenny, he said sarcastically. He was too sleepy. She closed the door behind her with one hand. She looked him in the eye as she demanded, You have to go to the city. Now. Why? He checked his smartwatch for the time. It's only eleven in the morning. She stared at his messy bedridden hair in disdain. Were you seriously still in bed? I was sleeping in, he replied defensively. It's the weekend. I'm allowed. It doesn't matter. You have to put on your suit and fly to New Welch. Emo is in danger. That woke him up like a bucket of ice cold water. What do you mean? Dr. Downfall is going to attack the city, she explained impatiently. He's going to blow up the King State building. Emo is going to be trapped in there. How do you know all this? Why does it matter? She glared at him. Focus on what's important. Emo is in danger. You're a hero, so go and save her. She was right. He had to focus on what was happening with Emo. He had a feeling she knew about Emo being in danger the same way she knew he was electric. He was really glad he never took off the smartwatch. Okay, I'm going. Wait. Jenny put a hand on his arm, stopping him from jumping out the window. We have to get heart. What? He stared at her in disbelief. No. You'll need all the help you can get for this. 
and Hart cares about M.O. too. You can work together to save her. I am not working with Blaze Hart, Eli declared. Not in this lifetime, not even the next one. You need to swallow your pride, Eli Wilde, she retorted. My best friend's life is on the line here, and I'm not going to let her die because you and Hart can't play nice. You don't know what he's capable of. She cut him off, he's Sons Park. He's a villain. Are we call caught up? How? She opened the door and Blaze was standing there about to knock. He blinked at the two of them. He looked around as if checking if he was in the right place. He said to Jenny, You texted me that M.O. wanted to talk to me here. I lied, she replied glibly. Must in danger. What? She pushed past him and gestured for them both to follow her. I'll explain on the way. Blaze and Eli looked at each other, as if they could help each other make sense of the whirlwind that was Mo's roommate. They were equally baffled. Come on. Jenny called out as she made her way down the hallway. We don't have all day. Jenny told Blaze what she told Eli about Dr. Downfall and the King State Building. Blaze didn't bother trying to interrogate how Jenny knew this and wanted to rush straight to the city. Driving would take too long, Jenny pointed out. Flying is faster. Flying is not one of my abilities, Blaze replied. Eli can with his suit. Eli shook his head quickly. I'm not giving him my suit. I don't want it anyway, Blaze returned. I don't need accessories. Do your mail posturing later, Jenny cut in. What I meant is that Eli can fly and carry Blaze there. Eli Grima said, No. He won't be able to carry me, Blaze remarked, raising an eyebrow. Look at his arms. He couldn't lift a fork. Eli was very offended. I can definitely carry you. I'm very strong. I'll believe it when I see it, wild. Five minutes later, Eli suited up and left the SETI campus, carrying Blaze in his arms. They both kept their gazes forward, refusing to look each other in the eye. This was awkward enough without them having close eye contact even with their masks in the way. If you drop me, I will come back and haunt you, Blaze declared. I'll do it. You will never have peace again. My spirit will continue on in this world out of spite. He was almost as dramatic as Tadashi was. Eli couldn't believe Emo was dating this guy. How are we so sure that Jenny is telling the truth? Eli Kvistsen. What if this all an elaborate prank? As evil as I think Jenny Moon is, I don't see her joking around about Mo's safety. I say this with pre-existing contempt for her. Any advice on how to fight Dr. Downfall? You have experience with his inventions. Eli vividly remembered that metal box that kept him struck to the ground, unable to move. He didn't want to deal with another of those again. It has a 15 feet radius. If you blast him from a distance you should be fine, Blaze explained. It specifically targets the metal of your suit. If you have to, take the suit off. But he'll see my face. Beats dying like a sitting duck. They reached the city and Eli headed for Midtown. He landed on the rooftop of a nearby apartment. The King State building was visible and Eli used his suit to search for M.O. in the building. She was at one of the floors looking at the view of the city. No Dr. Downfall in sight. Everything looks fine, Eli said. I told you Jenny might be pranking us. The rest of what he said was drowned out by the helicopter heading towards the building. Dr. Downfall jumped out and landed on the top of the building. He had a silver cane in hand. He tapped it on the floor and a green light appeared and covered the entire structure. I don't think Jenny was joking, Blaze concluded. Chapter 50 Hybrid Eli tried to think. From the helicopter, a dozen mechanical spiders the size of large dogs jumped out and landed on the King State building. They broke through the windows and into the building. There were screams of terror from the people inside. We need a plan, Eli declared. We need to disable that green force field. Kill the robot spiders and get all the people out. I just want to get Mo out. Everything else isn't really my problem, Blaze replied. Eli glared at him. There are innocent people in there. And I'm a supervillain. Did you forget? Fine, Eli conceded. Help me get in there and kill off any spiders that come after us and you get Mo out. I'll take care of the doctor and the rest. Sounds good to me. Eli flew them down to the bottom of the King State building. He tried to touch the force field and it caused his suit to glitch. Force field will cause suit to disable, Rose chimed in. I advise to step away from the force field. Bummer, Blaze said. You might have to do this mission without the fancy suit. The suit retreated into Eli's smartwatch. I can fight without it. They stepped into the force field. It didn't hurt them. Eli's smartwatch sparked before going dead. Rose was down for the count. How many floors does this building have? Blaze asked. 
102. Eli remembered from the many times Emmo talked about it. The King State Building was her favorite in New Welch. Hopefully, the spiders didn't disable the elevator. The electricity was thankfully still working. They took the elevator and headed straight to the top floor. The elevator stopped right before the 100th floor. Eli pressed the elevator buttons but nothing was happening. He and Blaze shared a look of exasperation. Eli boosted Blaze to open the emergency hatch at the top of the elevator. The blonde climbed out and Eli leaped behind him. They climbed the wall ladder and entered the 100th floor. It was eerily quiet. They looked around them trying to find anyone. A spider crawled down from the ceiling. Blaze sent a large gust of fire at it, and it screamed as it melted into a charred hunk of metal. That's one down, Blaze stated casually. Watch out. A spider leaped at them and Eli threw an electrical blast at it. The spider shook before it collapsed to the ground motionless. That's two down. They had to take the stairs going up to the next floor. They destroyed a few more spiders as they went. When they finally reached the 102th floor, they took the stairs to the rooftop. They peeked through the door to find Dr. Downfall standing over a group of people. The spiders must have gathered them there. Emma was among them trying to remain calm. Eli had to fight the urge to run straight to her. They still had four spiders and the doctor to deal with. I'll take care of the spiders, Blaze whispered to him. You knock out document. I'll get Emo out. He'll see my face. Blaze took off his red mask and handed it to him. I'll say you stole it. But people will see you. He shrugged. As long as the doc doesn't see me helping you I'll be fine. Emo already knows about me being Sunspark. They didn't have time to discuss that revelation. They opened the door and Eli ran straight for Dr. Downfall. He threw a large blast of electricity at him that threw the man off his feet. Blaze threw a gust of fire at the remaining spiders that shrieked as they melted. The doctor recovered quicker than expected. He staggered to his feet and pointed his silver cane at Eli. A new superhero? Don't even have a suit yet. How pathetic. It's a work in progress, Eli replied, and threw another blast at him. The doctor blocked it with his cane and it seemed to absorb it. You're outmatched. At the corner of his eye, he watched Blaze grab Emo and drag her away. Emo tried to fight him off but he was stronger. He whispered something to her that made her stop. She stared straight at Eli before Blaze took her hand and pulled her to the stairs to escape. Satisfied that Emo was safe, Eli turned back to the doctor and tried to think. The cane was the source of the force field and it could absorb energy. He didn't like thinking about the time he nearly killed Blaze but it did teach him something. What's your name, kid? The doctor asked. Or haven't figured that out yet? It's electric. He threw a series of energy blasts at him, making it larger and stronger each time. The cane absorbed it all until it was glowing bright neon green. Eli concentrated and summoned the largest energy blast he ever had. It felt like a lightning bolt in his hands. He threw it at the doctor and the cane exploded into a million pieces. The force field disappeared. Dr. Downfall stared at him in shock. Eli walked up to him and knocked him out with a punch. The people around him cheered. Somebody asked, What happened to your suit, Electric? Eli rubbed the back of his neck. It's in the shop. He saluted them and ran out of there. Rose was still disabled. He would have to go to the HL Tower and Mr. Carlyle's son could hopefully help him get her and the suit working again. As he left the King State Building, he pulled off Blaze's mask and made a note to return it to him. Emma was safe. She was probably thanking her boyfriend somewhere. He tried to bury any twinge of jealousy. He hadn't come there to change her mind about how she felt about him. He went because he loved her. It didn't really matter anymore that she didn't return it. She had made her choice and he was going to be happy for her. It was time to be a better f Chapter 51, Electric Emmo had run out of the King State building with Blaze and into the street. They made it to the end of the street before Emmo stopped. Blaze noticed and urged her to keep moving. She pulled away. We have to go back, she insisted. Eli is fighting there all alone. We have to help him. Wild will be fine, Blaze replied. This was the plan. I get you out and he takes care of document. Emo shook her head. I don't care what your plan was. I'm coming back for him. Don't be stupid, Emo. What could you possibly do to help him? Just because I don't have powers, it doesn't mean I'm useless. Blaze sighed deeply. You're right. I'm sorry. I've just been stressed with fighting robot spiders and getting you to safety. I'm safe now. Mission accomplished. Emmo said. You can go. Thanks for the help. He held her wrist so she couldn't walk away. Be logical. If you rush back in there, Eli wouldn't be able to fight properly because he'll be worried about you. 
It's better that you stay somewhere safe until it's over. She stared at the King State Building, conflicted. She knew Blaze was right. Eli couldn't be distracted during battle. Could become fatal. Fine. She turned back to Blaze and shook his hand. I have some place I can go. I'm not going with you. Montag. We should break up. His eyes widened. What? Bad timing, I know, she continued. But I need to stop avoiding this. We need to break up. This isn't working. Is it because I'm Sun's Park? Partially. I can't date a villain. I tried to make peace with it, but I can't, she admitted. And I realized I didn't think about you at all during winter break. I didn't miss you. He looked like she punched him in the gut. What are you saying? I don't love you, Blaze. Give it time. It's only been a few months. It's not that. I don't feel the same way about you. Because you're in love with Wild. He scoffed. IFC Kenny knew it. Her eyebrows furrowed. You did. He was always chasing after you like a sad puppy. And he's a hero so of course you'd want him. Blaze sounded bitter. It's not just because he's a hero. I don't really care. His green eyes bore into her. Have a nice life, Emo. He turned away and left without looking back. She stared at the King State building and hoped Eli was okay. This waiting was terrible. She had an idea of what Susanna had felt all those years, waiting for Uncle Felix to come back from missions. If she was going to wait, she knew where she had to go. Eli had gone to the HL Tower and dropped off the suit and watched to Mr. Carlo's son who promised to send the items back to him when they were working again. He would have to take the train back to campus. While he was in the city, he had decided he didn't have to rush. He could visit Catherine. She wasn't home when he went to her apartment. He made his way to the rooftop of the building. It had been his favorite place growing up. The view of the city from the rooftop had been his entire world at one point. He paused when he saw Emo sitting on a lawn chair. He and Alex had hauled a few of them up onto the roof one summer. She smiled brightly when she saw him. She ran over and wrapped her arms around him in a tight hug. Thank God you're okay, she said. I was so worried. He exhaled in relief, knowing she was safe lifted a heavy weight off his chest. He let himself be selfish for a full minute and enjoyed her embrace. Eventually, he pulled away and looked over her. Are you okay? Spiders didn't cut off any limbs, he asked. She laughed. No. They were remarkably gentle as they crowded us to the rooftop. I feel a little bad for murdering them all now. Sobering, he added. I want to apologize to you. For what? The last time we talked I acted like a total jerk. You were right. I don't get to be mad at you for dating somebody else, he said. It doesn't matter what I feel about Blaze. He's your boyfriend. And I just want you to be happy. Ellie. Can we go back to being friends? He stared at her pleadingly. I really miss you, Amo. I miss you too, she admitted. You're the only that doesn't mind it when I'm bossy. He shook his head, smiling. You just care a lot. She smiled back. At least someone appreciates me. Then she added, I broke up with Blaze. He stilled. His heart began beating faster in his chest. It felt like the air before the first flash of thunder. You did. I realize that I'm in love with you, she admitted. She looked almost scared. Do you still feel the same way about me? I couldn't stop. I tried. At her crestfallen face, he amended. I didn't try very hard. I am still awkwardly in love with you. And I can't believe you feel the same way. She took his hand and led him towards the view of the city. Do you remember when you brought me here for the first time? You invited me to Pumpkin Fest because I was so homesick, and you wanted to cheer me up. You told me this is your favorite place in the city, and you explained it by pointing out your favorite places around, she continued. There's the bakery your sister buys croissants, the cafe where you freeloaded over their Wi-Fi, and the animal shelter you used to volunteer at. She knew all the places by heart, like she had been the one to grow up there. She confessed, I think I began to fall in love with you in that moment because you paid attention to the little things. You love this city the same way I love Kunth Bay Valley. He couldn't speak. He was too scared to say the wrong thing. I didn't notice what I was feeling at first because it felt so natural, she said. Loving you just felt like breathing. I know the feeling, he replied. You make everything quiet in my head. You're my safe harbor. There was no need to talk anymore. She pulled him down for a kiss. They were in no great hurry to make it perfect. They had a lifetime to work on that. 